It's time for the 420 Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available daily on our website at 420radio.org. Now, here's Priscilla Simon. I'm afraid Priscilla's got the giggles. Can you hear everything okay yet, Priscilla? Still no audio. All right, let me uh, try and dial that back out to you real quick. Sometimes we have some difficulties on our Skype connection. We got to make sure that's working. Can you hear okay, Priscilla? I can hear great now. (laughs) All right, go right ahead. All right, so here's what the news. Washington State's first legal marijuana stores are open for business on Tuesday, July 8th. The Washington State Liquor Control Board is issuing about 20 of the state's 300 34 licenses on Monday, July 7th, and the licensees can spend that first 24 hours entering their inventory into the state tracking system. Michael Perton Perkins, who expects to open his I-502 store on Seattle's 15th Avenue Northeast, expects prices to be, quote, 20 to $25 a gram until the producers reduce their prices. I expect to run out of products, end quote. One bear rejected the rumor that producers are charging $5,000 a pound to the new retailers, saying, so we were, we were asking $2,800 per pound, and we are asking the retailers we work with to cap their price at $420 per ounce to consumers. One retailer explained the difficult market Washington will be for him, saying, quote, you have to compete against the medical and black market while offering super high prices and limited supply, end quote. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting rollout starting uh, July 8th here in Washington state. And it's going to be different than what we had to go with uh, under Colorado's law, because under Colorado law, they already had uh, a fairly well-regulated medical marijuana system uh, that was going on. And so the uh, the Colorado market uh, doesn't exactly provide any guidance for what we're going to be doing in the Washington market. Uh, in the Washington market, we do still have the medical marijuana industry that is set up. The legislature tried to tear that down uh, earlier, but uh, had no success at that. But the reason they wanted to do so was for the fear that people that would be facing this uh, I-502 market would find the prices too high and then try to cheat their way onto the medical marijuana program to get the lower prices at the medical dispensaries. And with the tax rate essentially ending up to be 25% times three plus sales tax, when you're talking about 20 to $25 per gram, nobody I know wants to pay those kind of taxes. Now, some of the people interviewed for the story kind of pointed at Colorado and said, most of the people shopping at the uh, recreational market are more of the tourist market, and they still have a medical market running alongside of that. But again, I don't think, I think it's kind of an apples to oranges comparison when Colorado's is so well regulated and the differences between medical and recreational aren't that great in Colorado. Medical, you can have six plants and two ounces. Recreational, you can have six plants and one ounce. And the tax rates, while they're high in Colorado, they're not exorbitantly high like they are in Washington State. And Washington State doesn't allow for home grow. So I predict that the uh, revenues that are going to be found by Washington State will be far lower than what were found in Colorado, that the legislature is going to realize they made a mistake, that it's been overtaxed, that it's going to have to be adjusted, especially after Oregon passes legalization in November, where the tax rates will be capped at a buck twenty-five per gram. You can bet that our opponents will say, see, marijuana legalization doesn't work. And they will, of course, ignore all of the uh, extenuating circumstances that are making uh, legalization not work in Washington state. But I think this will just be a temporary problem. It'll only last a couple of years. As more states legalize, as more business flows in the marijuana industry, Washington state will have to adjust those taxes, will have to adjust their recreational market, or they will just be left behind. that a family on trial in Washington may not mention medical marijuana in court. Quote, in regard to the medical marijuana evidence, I'm still persuaded that, that, that it will confuse the jury. U.S. District Judge Fred Van Sickle of the Eastern District of Washington said during a pre-trial hearing teleconference on Monday, quote, I don't think medical marijuana evidence is relevant, end quote. 
The family of five sought to present evidence that the marijuana they grew was in fact legal under state law, doctor recommended, and appropriate for each for each family member's condition. The federal government charged each defendant with six felonies, including manufacturing, possession, and distribution of marijuana, and possession of a firearm in furtherance of drug trafficking. The trial is expected to begin at the end of July. The defendants face maximum penalties that range from 40 years to life in federal prison. Yeah, big shame in this trial and it's not any different from a lot of uh, trials that have gone down where people involved with medical marijuana aren't allowed to bring that up in federal court and it's very disturbing to me because i can understand saying the evidence is irrelevant that the testimony might be irrelevant that under federal law marijuana is illegal but i don't understand how preventing people from mentioning it does any service to the cause of justice I think these defendants should be able to say, look, we were operating under state law. Look, we we're medical marijuana patients. We registered. We jumped through the hoops. And then if the judge wants to instruct the jury that that evidence uh, means nothing with respect to the federal charges, that's fine. But to not allow people to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth seems to me counter to our judicial experience here in America. These people should be allowed to tell the whole truth in in their trial. And the other problem that we've got here that I've got with this is the additional charges of possession of a firearm in furtherance of drug trafficking, which always makes it say, sound as if these guys have, you know, got loaded weapons and they're, you know, checking everybody at the door and they're making that it's a big gun thing when it's not. These people live in rural Washington. They've got hunting weapons. They've got weapons of self-protection. They got stuff that is never used in any way with respect to their marijuana business, but the federal government finds it easy easy to add a couple of gun charges because that is the uh, federal exception to the second amendment if you're a marijuana consumer. Marijuana, uh, Marilyn Delegate Heather Heather is running for governor and her outspoken support for legalization of marijuana has brought up the issue for all can- for all the candidates. When asked by WBA BALTV her opinion of legalization, Nazir said, quote, marijuana prohibition makes our communities less safe and waste valuable law enforcement resources. Why should we treat something less toxic and addictive any different than alcohol or tobacco? And so, her Democratic competitors, Attorney General Doug Gansler and Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, support Maryland's recent decriminalization but oppose legalization. Brown wants to, quote, learn from Washington and Colorado's experience and assess whether additional changes to Maryland's law are warranted, end quote. Gansler wants to, quote, include Maryland's health professionals, law enforcement, and community organizations in a debate that should favor health and security, so not a rush to tax a new source of income to address budget pressures. Also, Republicans running for governor told WBALTV they oppose legalization. But one businessman, Larry Hogan, supports decriminalization, saying, quote, well, I don't want to make it easier for people to use drugs. Fucking up someone for a very small amount of marijuana seems unjust. Yeah, it absolutely does seem unjust. And uh, sorry about the connection difficulties we're having, folks. We're trying to make sure that this is uh, as good a bandwidth as we can get here for uh, Priscilla out there. But uh, yeah, the story on Heather Mazur coming out as you know so pro-marijuana legalization as she's running for governor has forced the rest of these candidates to have to you know, address the issue and maybe they really don't want to. Uh, This is pretty typical where uh, the Democrats are willing to get behind decrim and even one Republican seems to be behind the decrim measure here, but nobody wants to make that step toward legalization. And we're going to hear a lot of this over the next few years of, well, it's too soon to tell yet. Let's wait and see what Colorado and Washington do. Let's wait and see what Colorado and Washington do, which is why I always thought it was so imperative that we moved forward with states in 2014. There was a lot of push from the national organizations to wait until 2016, maybe only go with Alaska in 2014, which I don't think would be uh, enough of a state in the national conversation to make much difference. But adding Oregon to the list of states by 2014 and adding a bunch more states in 2016 will make it so that that little talking point of, well, let's wait and see what Colorado and Washington do uh, become a little less effective.
Or which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's the kind of debate that has swirled around marijuana use in schizophrenia. Researchers have long known that cannabis use is greater among people with schizophrenia, with schizophrenia and people who use cannabis are twice as likely to develop schizophrenia. However, the question was always whether cannabis leads to schizophrenia or does schizophrenia lead to cannabis? Now, researchers at the Institute of Psychiatry, of Psychiatry at King's College London have discovered that people with a genetic predisposition towards schizophrenia also share a predisposition towards cannabis use. Not only were folks with the genes for schizophrenia more likely to use cannabis, but are more likely to use more of it than folks without the genes. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. This is stuff that we've talked with Dr. Mitch Earlywine many times before, uh, trying to tease out what is the relationship between schizophrenia and cannabis. Now, the other side, of course, wants to say, ah, you smoke weed, you'll go schizo, which is not true. We found that there's a correlation, but not a causal relationship. It's not that you smoke, smoke marijuana and you become schizophrenic. It's that some people who are schizophrenic then turn to marijuana to help ease their symptoms. And now apparently we're finding that the same gene that leads someone toward schizophrenia also leads someone toward cannabis use and more of it. This seems to me to be more, uh, more of a, a confirmation of the theory of self-medication than the confirmation of our opponent's theory that marijuana causes any sort of schizophrenia. Drug Policy Alliance has dropped its support of California's SB 1262, a bill intended to finally establish statewide regulation of the medical marijuana industry. DPA singled out the fact that the bill leaves intact the patchwork of county and city regulations that means severe restrictions, moratoriums, and outright bans on medical cannabis access. Quote, there is nothing in the bill clarifying which entities are responsible for enforcement or who will promulgate, excuse me, promulgate the rules that oversee the implementation of this program. Many localities have banned dispensaries, and very few have approached the idea of licensing cultivation because of the lack of support at the state level. Finally, this bill leaves cultivators extremely vulnerable because few, if any, localities regulate cultivation. And so, the bill is still supported by police chiefs and Americans for safe access. Yeah, this is the problem that we've had with uh, California since the beginning is any sort of uh, statewide regulation of the medical cannabis industry. And this just means the more conservative areas of the state. There's some 23 counties, I think, now that have banned medical marijuana businesses and a bunch of cities that have done so as well. So if you're going to have a Senate bill 1262 that's supposed to regulate state medical marijuana, how do you do that and still let the localities come up with their bans and their moratoriums? If there's going to be a statewide regulation, it needs to ensure that all patients throughout the state, even if they live in a conservative county, even if they live somewhere east and, and rural, that they can still have access to the medical cannabis guaranteed to them under the Compassionate Use Act. Everything else seems to be giving up, if you ask me. That's all the time we got for the news. It's 420 in Denver, where we're going to send Priscilla in search of more bandwidth. <laughs> it's okay. We're still working things out. It's all fine, girl. Take it easy. We're back with Behind the Headlines right after this.